Harper. <laughs> right, so let me share these people. Put my phone on silent and get this shared. Right, so. Right, I can't believe that the this internet is playing up as well. Yes, yeah, salam. Let me get this shared. Right, and get this out there. Lahva, lahva, un momento, por favor. Just sharing it, not ignoring you folks. Alaikum as salam. Those of you just tuning in. Uh, what is going on? So. Why are none of my usual emojis around? <laughs> right, let me just post that. Sorry about that. For a moment, even this internet, I've changed the whole damn internet and it still had some, some issues. But, right, okay, I think that's been shared. Inna alhamdulillah wa kafa. والصلاة والسلام على رسوله المصطفى وعلى عباده الذين ارتضى ومن بهداه مهتدى وبآثار أهل المدينة اقتفى وبعد فسلام الله على القوم أهلا وسهلا Bienvenido a la lección de esta semana mi gente and swagatam swagatam all right, <laughs> people, what a week, what a week, what a week it's been since last, since last week, <laughs> and uh, the little kind of, I don't know, the rumble that we caused. So, ahlan wa sahlan, ahlan wa sahlan, those people, katu rahma, it's good to see you online, C.A. Solomon, all right, como estas? Right, muy bien, muy bien. All right, the pun. <laughs> Daif. <laughs> Daif. Right, people, what can I say? What can I say? There's been some haters galore. I gotta say, the haters. Yes, salam. They've been pouring out, I tell you. <laughs> from every angle you can imagine but let's see let's see i'll speak a little about them as we go into today's session do i follow english football i don't actually i don't watch any sports uh right yep project mark and block is in full force people full force right those of you tune in people ahlan wa sahlan ahlan wa sahlan Click like, click share, right, get this out there, Bilal Chowdhury, likewise, it's great to see you online. Right, I don't know why that is, people, looks like uh, some people have been doing magic on my internet. <laughs> They've been sending the demons out there, so, but hopefully I've reconnected it to a different Wi-Fi uh, hot spot so let's see how this goes people let's see how this goes hopefully inshallah it will be okay let me just so let's get back to this wa alaikum assalam all right does it keep hopefully it'll be a lot uh it will be better now i just switched the kind of wi-fi to a different closer hot spot so let's see 
Mm-hmm. Evil eye. The evil eye, people. Evil eye. All right. So many people, I tell you, they they get so frustrated with this sign. <laughs> Rock on. That's why I do this to to infuriate them even more. Mwah. All right. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, people. Right. So, ahlan wa sahlan, folks. Ahlan wa sahlan. Those of you just tuning in, click like. Click share. Get this out there, people. Get it out there. Kubir, Kulbir Singh says, Kida, Sasriya Kal, Kulbir Singh, G. Right, so, Abu Muawiyah, the devil sign. Hell yeah. You know that. You know that. <laughs> this is to, people get so wound up. They're like, oh my God. Oh my God. Right, so, Look at that. The questions have begun, people. Can we invest in cryptocurrency? Say, Cornuto in Italy, right? Right. I take it, yeah, I think this is actually Italian for it was against the evil eye, in essence. I was uh, reading somewhere that the origin for it. But nevertheless, who cares about origins, huh? <laughs> it's not like Halloween stopped us or Christmas. <laughs> right, so folks, click like, click like, click share, get this out there, let the fitan and facade begin. So, right, let me also, I'm going to get to the page with all the questions. Is this moving fine, is it? Koyes, Mia, hope all is well. Keep up the good work. Shukran, shukran. Cameron, Peter, J. Clear asks about Adam, alayhi uh, salam, his cubit hadith. His cubit hadith? Oh, on his height. Good question. In fact, shall we take that question to begin with? Right, let's take that question to begin with. Abu Mu'adh is in the house, people. All right. Those of you tuning in, click like, click share, people. I will be addressing some of the haters later on. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. So let's take some questions. It's always good to see uh, the questions people have. I'm just trying to get to my page to... Why is wool a spiritual protection? Wool is not a spiritual protection. I'm not sure where anybody's got that from. Khalil Muhammad, alaykum as salam. Uh, right, somebody, Sid is saying he's reading the book Sapiens. That is an awesome book, an incredible book that I recommend for everybody. Uh, all right, we've got the Maliki Viking in the house, Ben. People, post your questions. Let's see. Let's take that that question first. That. Adam alayhi salam, our father, Adam. <laughs> you know, this is another thing on a side note. I'd like to say, let me take a, uh, let me wake up a bit. <sighs> Look at that. Adam alayhi salam. You see, I've addressed before this whole thing. Adam alayhi salam, I have said before, is to me one of the most incredible personalities, if you like, or prophets or people that I would just love to know more and more about. And there's just so, I mean, unfortunately, there isn't so much we can access, but it's, uh, I've always got that intriguing kind of burning um, curiosity really to just learn more nevertheless about adam alayhi salam there are many things which are not true okay that we have kind of circulated in our midst amongst them things like for example how he was created allah uh, sent for a certain amount of soil from this part of the earth certain amount of soil from that part of the earth a certain amount put this together this made adam alayhi salam <coughs> these kind of riwayat are all problematic okay 
it can never be right until until the drink is on point, people. Until the drink is on point. Right now, let me just move my drinks closer to me. <laughs> within reach. Within reach. So at least I can see them. <laughs> as as Ghalib would often say, at least if nothing, then at least let me just look at look at them. Right, so the the thing about Adam alayhi salam, all these ahadith are problematic. Uh, Abu Bakr ibn Fawraq, who is a great scholar uh, from almost a thousand years ago, in the four um, in the four hundred hijris, he has he has several works, but one of his popular works is Mushkilul Hadith, the problematic, problematized hadith, and especially those to do with belief or those to do with things like Adam alayhi salam. And in there, he puts all of these hadith. He puts the hadith to do with Adam being created from different soils, colored soils, uh, Adam, and all these kind of things. Uh, Adam and his height being 60 kind of lengths long, as in Sahih al-Bukhari, is unacceptable. This riwayah is unacceptable, people. So even if it is in Bukhari, walau! Wallo, even if, do you think every hadith in Bukhari is Sahih? Hell no. Yes, overall, they, they it's you know overall, the Sahih al Bukhari is Sahih. The overwhelming hadith in there are Sahih, but are all the hadith in Sahih al Bukhari Sahih? Of course not. Of course not. And I'll begin with an example from. The final chapter uh, uh, in Kitab al-Tafsir, if you go to the hadith on Isra, uh, that is transmitted uh, on Sharik and Anas radiallahu an, that the Messenger of Allah went on the night journey three years before he even became a prophet. Everybody accepts that hadith to be unacceptable. Everybody. Let alone other ahadith which are in Sahih al-Bukhari, which are also problematic. So... Yes, when you're going to compare them with the overwhelming ahadith that you have in Sahih al-Bukhari. So generally people say you have possibly about 8,000 hadith if we're going to go in its totality in Sahih al-Bukhari. Yes, the overwhelming majority of them are fine, they're excellent, well-preserved. But amongst them, there is a certain margin of error, people. A certain margin of error. Um, so amongst them is this hadith as well about Adam alayhi salam. This is not a sahih, uh, this is not an, um, a valid hadith. It may be sahih in its chain, but it's not valid. And something the scholars started to do less, place less emphasis on was mutton criticism. So when you look at a hadith, you ought to look at its chain and its mutton and its content so as the years went by the scholars started to place less emphasis on the content which is a huge mistake a huge mistake right so now how do i know that this hadith is sahih even before me many scholars have problematized this hadith um, as i've mentioned people like ibn fawraq People like even Ibn Hajar in uh, Al Asqalani in his Fatul Bari highlights that when you look at the prior uh, gener um, civilizations before us, and he refers to people like Thamud and all these kind of other civilizations whose ruins were some of which were still preserved in his time, he says that we see that their abode and their kind of bones and their kind of things resemble us. So he highlights this demonstrates that this hadith of Adam being so tall and everybody decreasing is problematic. And he says, I don't know, uh, but this does not seem valid then. This does not seem true. And there are other hadith as well, people. So don't be kind of surprised about this. An example is the hadith of, uh, an, uh, of magic being done onto the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which I've highlighted in my course, along with 
Sheikh Akram Nadwi. And by the way, Sheikh Akram Nadwi as well in that course, which is on YouTube, highlights that this hadith of Adam alayhi salam, he gives as an example, is unacceptable as well. So that's not just me saying that. Yeah, you know, very uh, people like Sheikh Akram Nadwi who are understood as very senior scholars and people who are very kind of conventional and traditional. This is how uh, people like Sheikh Akram, may Allah bless him, is viewed. So even he, he concurs on this point. And there are many other ahadith, by the way, things like the magic one, which I've highlighted and the whole course discusses other things as well. There's a very problem. There's other problematic hadith. You have to recognize hadith which are blasphemous. Almost. And they've been um, kind of uh, blasphemous towards the Prophet. So a hadith, an example uh, is the hadith of Musa alayhi salam. This hadith, scholars, some scholars did problematize these hadith. The, the hadith about Musa alayhi salam having a, uh, an alleged problem with his genitals. I mean, this kind of hadith is absurd that Muslims would ever tolerate such kind of nonsense about the Prophet of God. Now, in the hadith, it mentions that the Bani Israel, the Israelites, would bathe together and Moses would bathe separately. And so the Israelites began to say that, oh, the reason he uh, bathes separately is because... Uh, he is, the Arabic word for it is Adar. Okay, Adar. So <laughs> people were past the watershed. And you know if it's Monday nights with Mufti, it's going to be live and unrestricted. So you've got the warning anyway. So now the thing is, in this hadith, it mentions the term Adar, which means somebody with abnormally swollen testicles. Right, so... This is, so this is what they refer to the Prophet Moses as in the Hadith. So they say, he's Adar. This is why he doesn't bathe with us. So what happens in this story is that when Moses, peace and blessings be upon him, is bathing, he puts his clothes down on the rock and when he comes out, the rock starts to run away. No, not the rock, the, the wrestler, the rock. <laughs> this is the rock, people. The rock with his... Damn, my pillow ain't here. <laughs> so the rock gets up and starts running off. So we've got a rock running with his clothes on there. And Musa, alayhi salam, is running after the rock. This is in, the, this is in Sahil Bukhari. So Musa, alayhi salam, is running after the rock. And the rock is running with Musa, alayhi salam's clothes on there. And then... Musa catches up, but now he's, because he's all naked, all of Banu Israel, the Israelites, see his genitals and say, oh, so I guess, we guess he's not Adar after all. He, you know, his, his testicles are normal. I mean, this is so blasphemous. And then Musa, alayhi salam, gets his stick and starts beating the rock up. I mean, seriously. You know, like... People are people believe this kind of stuff, and then they say that no, they're doing this for the honor of Islam. <laughs> I mean, seriously. So this is in Sahih Bukhari. Now, of course, that hadith is nonsensical. Of course, it's utter blasphemy. Of course, it's ridiculous to believe in certain hadith. Right. We do not believe in certain hadith. We do not compromise the honor of the prophets of God for just to succumb to this hadithi culture and just to please some scholars just because they said the chain is correct. Our loyalty always lies to the Quran, the Sunnah, the prophets. Before these people, we love and respect scholars, but... It doesn't mean that we become rude and disrespectful to the prophets of God just to support uh, an academic conclusion of one scholar or another. Right, so that's an example. So don't be sometimes shocked. So I think one of the greatest tragedies that has befallen this ummah has been this kind of, um, this hadithi kind of uh, culture that has kind of, 
what could be called as well the crypto shafi crypto shafization as um, dr sherman jackson calls it that this crypto shafization that's happened along the way but there seems to be a lot of this and especially in the last few centuries and now it seems to be commonplace that people seem to present Bukhari and Muslim as though they are the most authentic hadith. I mean, as though it is more authentic than the word of God. And, and that's not true, people. But overall, it's a great effort and an amazing uh, preservation of hadith. Overall, not in its entirety. Okay, so let's... What else... What questions have we got, people? Is there any evidence that to suggest that Adam arrived on Earth? Uh, I would believe that Adam was the first person to trigger the cognitive revolution. Um, that and before him, there were Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens did exist before Adam, salam, but he triggered the whole cognitive revolution how why where did he emerge what was all of these things at this stage i don't know and we don't know i'm not ashamed to say i don't know i don't know but i do know as allah says in the quran that وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حي. and that all life on earth has a single source of origin that is the word of god that is what I believe. How did it diversify the, the Cambrian explosion? How did things happen? The pre-Cambrian explosion? All these kind of things. How did this happen? Allah is not here to teach you, uh, you know, biology and evolutionary biology. Go figure. Go figure, people. Go figure. So that's... Uh, right. So what have we got here? Banana biryani everywhere. No idea what that's talking about. Is the Salafi ideology... We'll come back to that. We're going to come back to that. What, quali what qualities should one look for in a teacher? Hmm. I think accessibility, relatability, if somebody can relate to the teacher, if, the, if they can address the teacher. Look, I think people should have diverse teachers. You shouldn't be scared of having different teachers it's all good it's all good uh you know it's all uh i think people the the great imams of the past had hundreds and hundreds of teachers sometimes over a thousand teachers they had right salam from luto alaikum as salam sheikh jyoti kat jyoti katanidis all right are you a sufi uh I don't think I am. <laughs> no, I'm not a Sufi. Qualities to look. Uh, Fahad, stick to being stupid. Huh? Fahad, stick. <laughs> okay. As long as that's not. Uh, no, that won't be. Right. So, quick question. Yeah, fire away, people. Fire away with the questions. You criticize the use of Da'if Hadith. Mis label things haram because they are misused. Right. Okay. Now. Da'if hadith, can you use da'if hadith? Let's follow up with a bit of what happened last week, people. <laughs> so, <laughs> we had some person from Birmingham who came, who did a whole video dedicated to me and I was honoured, as I often am, by these gestures. <laughs> he got me with that gesture in Nati Nati. So I, last week, uh, if you haven't seen it, please do watch it. I dedicated some time of my life back to uh, this exorcist. He's an exorcist, claims to be an exorcist. Obviously, all these things are uh, <laughs> fiction and they don't, <laughs> they don't actually exist. But I mean, he claims in, in his worldview, in his imagination he deals with demons and things like this and so i mean that's not me mocking him that's just me describing him <laughs> and he said so i i did this video uh, uh 
evaluating his criticism in my usual style, in my Mufti style, Monday nights with Mufti style. And he got a little offended. Hi, hi, hi. Naraz ho ge. He got a little upset. So he, he, he made a post. He didn't do a comeback video. He made a post about me saying, he said, <laughs> he said, oh, he kept yelling, da'if, da'if. And if he was sincere, I would have taken down my video against him. Well, my dear <laughs> exorcist, I don't want you to take down your video against, against me. Keep it up. I want put more against me. <laughs> I'm sitting right here. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. So I don't want you to take that. And he said, well, you know, he kept yelling da'if, da'if. And, and I was, I never even said it was a hadith. I said it was the saying of the scholars. <laughs> yeah, you're embarrassing us. Because since when do Salafis, when have you gone from the slogan Quran was Sunnah, Quran was Sunnah to scholars, scholars, scholars? <laughs> this one, not nice, this one. You know, you gotta, you gotta be fair, people. You gotta be fair. So, and then he said, well, and so what if a hadith is da'if? Listen to this, people. This is a Salafi. So what if a hadith is da'if? Can't you use Da'if Hadith? The answer is no! <laughs> you cannot use Da'if Hadith. That is the madhab of Imam Bukhari. That is the madhab of Imam Muslim. That is the madhab of Imam Jawzaqani. That is the madhab of Imam Ibn Sayyid al Nas. That is the madhab of Qadi Abu Bakr ibn Arabi. That is the madhab of Shawkani. That is the madhab of Albani. That is the madhab of Ibn Hazm. That is the madhab of many of the muhaddithin. You cannot use Sahih Hadith. <laughs> Allah, Allah. <laughs> so next time you're reading the wrong script that's supposed to be the people that you know when you do Hanafi bashing because the Salafi let's be fair they have been madhab bashing for so long and I'm not picking on Salafis any Salafi watching this I'm not picking on you I'm just stating this has been happening so you're reading the wrong script here. <laughs> so, it's supposed to be the other people who are supposed to be saying, oh, it's okay, we can use da'if hadith, we can use da'if hadith, and you're supposed to be kind of condemning them. No. So you're reading the wrong script altogether. So that was that. Then he said, look, oh, and he read this verse of the Qur'an, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ uh, and he says that, you know, and this is وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا And it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, and, and in another verse, the kafirina. And, but what I read was also a verse of the Qur'an. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ مَوْعِذَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ That there is hiudan, there is guidance in وَالشِفَاءَ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ And all the Salafi scholars too, I mean, sorry, not all, many, many, you can check the fatawa of Uthaymeen and all these other scholars. Nobody says that the Qur'an has come to cure diseases. Nobody says that. And so if somebody's got, or, or, or things like somebody's got spinal injury and instead of doing surgery, everybody sits around reading the Qur'an, nobody says these kind of things. So to insinuate this is to just misguide people, misguiding people, right? So that's, so that's that. So I thought, well, I'll highlight that, but it looks like, <laughs> it looks like somebody, <laughs> somebody got upset. <laughs> somebody, khafa <laughs> What's that uh, Allama Iqbal says? That 
apne bhi khafa mujh se begane bhi na khush <laughs> that even that all people those who know me are upset with me and those who don't know me even they're upset with me that so ke zehre halahil ko main keh na saka kan that just because i couldn't call po- just because i called poison poison and refused to refer to it as sweet <laughs> as some kind of sweet candy so everybody's upset with me right people click like click share get this out there let's see saludos desde españa ara right, look at that we've got binam khan bienvenido bienvenido right ah, why don't you do one then uh rahma good question what is this question let's see we'll try to tackle some of these questions is blood transfusion haram <coughs> blood transfusion is not haram uh looks crazy talks like crazy wahid qari ji qari saab kahe ko sharminda karte hain aap well you're blocked anyway <laughs> That's what's going to happen people mock and block is in full swing right so I lose friends when I share hell yeah hell yeah that's that's the litmus test people that's the test that's the test the ayasabu nas do people think that they will say we believe wa hum la yuftanun and they will not be tested allah allah Right so donating organs or blood transfusion this is permissible absolutely permissible uh in fact sheikh uh the sheikh i often quote um ibn ashur the grand sheikh ul islam of his time and the grand mufti of the malikiya who lived up until the sex up until the 60s his kind of student and junior to him uh was sheikh muhammad uh, al aziz al juayit who who has some of his fatawa collected and he was the grand mufti of the maliki in his time and uh, this is like around in the 60s and in his fatawa back then he discusses this issue about tabarru giving gifting uh, organs okay and donating organs and how that is permissible within islam and you have to remember something you have to remember something people that in islam everything by default is permissible unless proven otherwise unless proven with overwhelming evidence to the contrary do not let them do not let them deceive you people do not let them simply tell you oh this is haram they must prove it by overwhelming clear it must be absolute categorically clear evidence okay conclusive explicit evidence to the contrary otherwise by default everything is permissible al asl fil ashya al ibaha so that's the uh, the whole the angle on blood transfusion and things like and some scholars they felt that blood transfusion is impermissible why because they said blood is najis blood is impure i disagree that blood is impure why is blood imp- why blood why <laughs> why is blood impure why so they said it's impure because allah says hurrima alaykum ad-dam that blood has been made haram for you I say I did I say that's a nice answer but that's an not the answer to my question <laughs> you see for that question I would have had to ask you is blood haram and you would say oh blood is haram I never asked you is blood haram to drink I asked you why is blood impure why por qué and you said because it's haram but poison is haram is poison impure no 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 
So you tried it, <laughs> but you got caught. So the point is, blood is not blood is not haram. Blood is haram. It's not impure. You see, blood to drink, as in to get a cup of blood, to go shkol, and then. Like people did in the past in kind of their, I don't know, paganistic rituals and things like this. That was made haram. And people generally don't drink blood anyway. As to the minute kind of uh, touches of blood. So let's say you get a certain amount of blood in your mouth. Your tooth starts bleeding or things like this and you swallow blood. Most of the scholars, the Malikiya, have written on this, Qarafi, other people, uh, Ibn Qaddah, many other ulama have written. Uh, Ibn Yunus brings in his uh, jami' and other scholars that, look, this is, this is not haram, because this is something that's accidentally kind of you're swallowing, it's mixing with your saliva and things like this. That is not haram. But to drink blood, as in to get cups and cups of blood and drink it, this is uh, impermissible, but to be fair, most people don't do that anyway. So there's no point kind of going into that. Is blood impure, I ask? Do we carry impurities that run? The blood running through my heart is pure. <laughs> How is it impure? So unless people can bring evidence which they can't, and I'll tell you they can't. Zor lagalo, pur o. Put your back into it. You will not be able to bring a single dalil. And this is my point of shutting down cognitive reasoning. Blind following. Blind following people. Why? You see, I say that, look, of course we should follow ulama. But of course, and I, above all, always advocate for the school of Medina. The Maliki Madhab. But the point is, we should always do things based on reason. There should always be reason. Okay, so when you ask for evidence, let people provide evidence. So, right, so I hope that answers some of those questions. Musa, you are tap. Let's see, what is this? Somebody. Is somebody kind of trolling? I can't. I can see people speaking about. Okay, well. Okay. I've... What is the Hanafi evidence that bleeding breaks wudu and Maliki evidence that it doesn't? It's not just the Maliki uh, evidence. Yep, sorry. Just before I move on, somebody asked about the verse. That Daman Masfuhan, the blood that has been shed. And that is the verse of the Quran. Unless Allah says these things are haram. That lahm al khinzir, that pork and dead animals, and Daman Masfuhan. Haram, haram. I'm not denying it's not haram. I'm accepting blood which comes out of animals, which is shed, to drink that is forbidden because it was seen as a kind of ritual of uh, many kind of satanistic kind of cults and things like that. So it has been made haram, but it is not impure. A distinction, people, distinction. <clears throat> Blood contains bacteria. Abe, you think the... <laughs> Well, I'm not telling you to drink it. <laughs> I said don't drink it. But that doesn't make it automatically impure because it's got bacteria in it. Dirt on the ground has bacteria on it. Is dirt impure? Hell no. Dirt ain't impure. Dirt is not impure. Soil is not impure. Soil has bacteria in it. Bacteria is everywhere. You've got bacteria on your hands, mate. You've got bacteria everywhere. Right? That is not... That, that just because there's bacteria in something doesn't make it Islamically impure. Okay, so, right, let's see what other questions have we got, people. So, 
those of you just tuning in, click like, click share, people. Get this out there. Just like alcohol is haram but not impure. Adam Khan, I agree with you and many ulama have. Other ulama have felt alcohol is impure. Um, I disagree with them personally. Uh, many uh, There have been many scholars right from the Salaf uh, who had the understanding that alcohol was haram but it was not impure. And amongst them people like Rabi Atur Ra'i, Ibn Shihab Zuhri, uh, several of the Malikiya. You've got so many of the Qarawiyin of the of the past. I don't mean like uh, of the Qarawi scholars, including um, you've got Ibn al-Haddad and many other kind of Maliki scholars and, and other people too felt that alcohol was uh, haram, but it wasn't impure. And the Dalil they used is in Sahih Muslim. The, it mentions that when the verses came down to say alcohol is forbidden, they spilt it in the streets of Medina. It mentions uh, that they spilt it fi sikakil Medina, in the streets, which is a haram, which is a sanctuary. So if it was impure, they wouldn't have just spilt it like that. That's the evidence that these people use. And I'm also inclined to that understanding. Is your haircut halal? Hell yeah, it's halal. What? Why are you imitating women by wearing necklaces? Well, Ahmed Ashami G. First of all, uh, if the only thing that makes you recognize gender is a necklace that, like a razor blade necklace, <laughs> then I feel sorry for either you or the women around you. <laughs> Because if the women around you look like this, they're like, they're like this, sitting there like this with goatees and they got kind of like, oh yeah, but they've got a necklace on. And you're like, well, right, uh, I, uh, sorry, I needed to speak to the woman here. Uh, no, it can't be him. It can't be. Oh, it must be him because he's got a necklace on. I mean, her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. What is it that you had to ask me? Uh, w would you mind spotting me at the gym? <laughs> it's just that, it's just that, uh, you know. <laughs> Seriously, is this what it, it takes to make you think I'm a woman? Like, I, I put this on and all of a sudden, I appear as a, as a, as a lady to you or a woman. Like, this, this is it. This is all that does it. <laughs> you do understand this physiology and anatomy. You do understand how the male female kind of body works, yeah? <laughs> and, uh, and the organs and things like this. It's not usually, you know, on the toilets, they've just got a necklace, like a razor blade necklace on one of the toilets, and on one they haven't. <laughs> what do they have with this? No necklace, they just got like blank. That must be male, blank. <laughs> necklace <laughs> so so for god's sake seriously right can you give a shout out hamid khan all right watches all my knee loves me well right back at you my brother right back at you right so what about exploiting people or polluting environment hell yeah exploitation is utterly haram exploitation is why many things were made haram in Islam. It's the true reason why things were haram in Islam. All right, we got Mark. Imam Mark is in the house, people. Imam Mark, those of you not following Imam Mark, you need to follow him, like, add him, reach out to him with your questions. Imam from the state side, who's got it on lock, people. That's what I'm talking about. With his stakes, gym, and the ilm. Right, so Mufti Abul, you keep emphasizing that we should begin to study the deen allowed to be ourselves. Right, I'm just sorry, but where are a safe space? Right, so. Right, so where is a safe space? Um, Imam Hassan, Ahlan wa Sahlan, Tasharrafna. Imam Hassan is in the house, people. Right, so where is a safe space to study? It's difficult to suggest. I think you have to study 
partially on your own. You, you, you have to look out for teachers. You have to be proactive. If you can go to an institute near you, do go to an institute. The institutes around you will not be perfect, just as nobody's perfect. You, me, nobody's perfect. But you take the good wherever you can find it. Do not be held down by sectarian divide. If you feel that there's... Uh, I know on this look, I do... Obviously, I'll have my differences with people. I'll kind of criticize them back. I'll do my usual mocking style. But in all honesty, uh, if you were to ask me, look, there's a madrasa close to where I live. Uh, it's a, let's say, it's a Salafi madrasa. It's a Diobandi madrasa. It's a Brilvi madrasa. It's whatever. If it's a place of knowledge and it gives you knowledge, then take it by all means. I I studied in a Salafi madrasa, believe it or not, I did as well. I've got an, uh, uh, I kind of graduated with their equivalent of a BA from Jamia Abu Bakr Salafiyah in a Diobandi madrasa, a Jamia Abu Nuriya in a Brilvi madrasa, Jamia Darul Alum Muhammadiyah Al Ghawthiya, which belongs to Pir Karam Shah in Islamabad. So studying with different people by all means love and respect them your own teachers but at the same time it doesn't what i what i make i don't like is becoming part of a cult becoming sectarian as in you have to now only reach out to those people you have to toe their line you have to push their narrative why why do i have to push their narrative like i don't belong to any of these groups I don't ever make any affiliations. The only affiliation I make is in fiqh, in jurisprudence, in Islamic fiqh. I give always preference to the school of Medina, which is the Maliki Madhab, going back to the city of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, the enlightened city, Medina Tul Manawwara, and as transmitted and taught by Imam Malik. I give preference to that above all. But... That said, what the school of Medina teaches me, apart from fiqh, is it teaches me a way of thinking and, and enlightenment. Right, so, in fact, let me, let me, let me explain religion to you people. Let, <laughs> let me explain religion, right? You're in for a treat, people, you're in for a treat. I'm about to explain religion. Okay, so, be... <laughs> so... Brace yourselves. It's about to go down. <laughs> right. I'm just going to, I think this is not on silent. I'm just going to put this on silent. One moment. Uh, right. Those of you just tuning in, click like, click share people. Uh, right. Click like, click share. Get this out there. Right, so right, so I'm going to explain religion. Let's get this out there. Let me explain. Let me give my analysis of religion, people. All right, compadre, estamos listos. All right, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking. Can you recommend any books to read on Maliki Fik? I can recommend them. There's loads, uh, but. In fact, okay, let me give you some examples and I'm going to come back to explaining religion. Those of you just tuning in, uh, Amani Santiago, Ahlan wa Sahlan, bienvenidos. I uh, hope you're well. I did see your Facebook message about not being well, so shafakillah. Right, uh, listen to this, stop criticizing his looks. Shukran, David, shukran. Right, now I'm going to... <laughs> Wazio is in the house, people. Wazio, what is a metaphor? <laughs> we had this awesome discussion uh, a few weeks back with some people. I, I spoke about it. But the brother in there kept explaining what a metaphor is. And it was so hilarious because he explained it about 10 times. <laughs> Using the same example every time. Right, so coming back to to this i'll just quickly highlight some maliki madhab stuff and then i'm going to go into explaining what is religion and my analysis so like share and then brace yourselves <laughs> it's gonna be a tsunami people right so 
In the Maliki Madhab, there's several things. You can begin with beginner texts like the Ashmawiya, which is made for just for beginners. Uh, there's uh, another a beginner's text called the Akhdari. Um, Ashmawiya is more taught in the Eastern Muslim world and uh, as in like the Middle East and, and Egypt and Akhdari more so in Morocco, Northwest Africa. Then you've got uh, after that, you can take a look at people sometimes look at Ibn Ashir. They've got different methods, by the way. Sometimes they look at a book called uh, Aqrabul Masalik. Um, I don't think that's in English. The Risala of Ibn Abi Zayd is in English. Uh, I have got a certain amount of commentary on the Risala. I'm going to try to make that available as well. I think I've got about 70 lessons on it, 7-0, when I used to teach it online. So I'm going to try to make that available. I have got my audio uh, commentary on the Ashmawi in six lectures. I've got an audio commentary on the Foundations of Islam by Qadi Iyad, who is a great scholar from Muslim Spain almost 900 years ago. And that's in 20 audio lectures. That is available. You can listen to that. Uh, the Risala, other people have done commentaries, is available. The commentary in English is available from Aisha Bewley's website in Norwich, UK. Um, other than that, I'm just trying to... Th I think that will give you a good understanding. There are books like Khalil, the Mukhtasar of Khalil, uh, which is seen as a... It's, it's a br brief text, but seen as woe. I would love to start teaching that at some point. I am thinking of beginning to teach the Talqeen. Talqeen is another book. If you are in Birmingham, uh, I know Sheikh Sidi Iqbal does teach um, Maliki Fiqh, so you can reach out to him. He's on Facebook as well. He's a great, great scholar, by the way. A hidden gem, refuses to kind of make himself be too well known, but he, I'm absolutely vouching he's a legend of a scholar Muhammad Iqbal on Facebook right so now let's get back to my analysis on religion now you see religion people you have to understand something uh, what is the meaning of this rock on <laughs> that's what it is people <laughs> so right now Okay, I'll deal with some of those questions. I'm just going to explain what an analysis on religion. Religion has certain layers to it. Certain layers, people. Or certain tiers or certain levels. Levels to this thing. There is religion as for... That is commonplace religion. That is for common general folks, general people for the laity, for laymen, for uh, for most people out there, common folk. I don't mean like people like scholars and so on, stuff like that. Just regular people who don't know too much about religion. Uh, these people out there, the majority normal people, religion at that layer is actually a kind of mythology and folklore. Religion at this layer is a very folkloric kind of tradition, religion. Um, every person emerges from this layer. So it's religion at this level is a kind of fantasy-like religion for people. It has to have things like superheroes, magic, demons. Uh, it has to have like, um, like sci-fi. It has to be things like... Like just unnatural, like very fantasy like religion, magic, voodoo, demons, evil spirits, all these kind of things have to happen at this level. I mean, this not have to happen, sorry, these people believe this is what religion is for them. Like religion has to have all this sci-fi, supernatural, mystical, kind of unbelievable superheroes fighting off demons, fighting off. This is how religion is understood at this common level. Most people recognize religion like that. The common people. And, and then full of rituals as well. Now what happens is there's a layer above that. This layer, the middle layer, is the layer of kind of knowledge, of Islamic kind of knowledge. Like those people who start to attain and obtain Islamic knowledge and learning. This layer doesn't necessarily 
provide enlightenment. It doesn't, it can do, but it's a journey right through this layer. And this layer is thick. This layer provides the kind of, uh, the detail of Islamic rulings, the legalisms, the legalistic rulings, the technicalities, the kind of, but it doesn't necessarily enlighten somebody. You see, many people, what, because everybody is from the first layer, including all of us, we emerge from that layer. They carry that kind of baggage with them. And then what they do is many scholars will reinforce the, the mythology of the first layer using Islamic detail. And I'm going to come back to this. Then there is a layer which I believe is through this the peak. This is the layer of enlightenment. This is the layer that teaches that religion, what was the objective of religion? What was the purpose for having these rulings? What did religion in essence come for? The problem here is this layer, the top, this enlightenment stage, seems so different to this fantasy stage that sometimes they can't recognize it. It's like the caterpillar and the butterfly. This metamorphosis, people like this kind of layer sees that as something totally different, something that defies the laws of gravity the butterfly does. It's seen as a completely almost different species almost to this layer of understanding. They reject it. They can't believe it to even be connected to this layer. But the truth is that is the nectar and the essence of religion. It came to teach people why creation needs to be connected to the creator. Now, many of the ulama in between, unfortunately, will not rise to that level. What they do is they gather information and then they reinforce the mythology using their information. And this is why Imam Malik said that Laysa al ilm, that true knowledge, would be that top layer. That Laysa al ilmu bi kathratir riwayat, it is not amassing. A huge amount of information. But it is a light, an enlightenment that that Allah places it in the hearts of, of you and enlightens you by it. So this is important to to kind of understand and let me I want to elaborate on this. I want to give you some examples for it to make sense. Right. Now, check this out. Why did Tawheed, the lesson of Tawheed come? Why did the lesson of Tawheed come? Why did Allah say, as the first commandment, I'lamu, know with certainty, I'lamu, that know with certainty, annahu la ilaha illa. That truly there is only one God. Why? Today all these people go on about shirk, 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 tawheed, tawheed. But they're not speaking about the true tawheed. Let's be honest. Let's be honest, people. Let's be honest. You see, tawheed came to remove the cobwebs of shirk. To remove the shackles of superstition. That people believed in evil spirits, demons, magic, voodoo, bad luck, bad omens. Oh my God, I've done this. The curse of so and so is on me. The curse of this is upon me. This is why Allah says in the Quran, on the tongue of uh, Luqman, 
when Allah is quoting him that he said, Ya Bunayya, when he's advising his son, La tushrik billah. La tushrik billah. Do not commit shirk. Inna shirka la thulmun hadim. That shirk is such a great thulm. Why is it a thulm? Allah says that in the nas, that people, La yadlimun Allah shay'an. That pe- we can't, is it a zulm for Allah? We can't oppress Allah. وَلَكِنَّ النَّاسَ أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ But yet they oppress themselves. So, the interesting thing is that this shirk is a zulm for us. We don't harm Allah by it. By saying, oh, I believe in all these things. We don't harm Him. We harm ourselves how do we harm ourselves we refuse to allow ourselves to develop to grow we shackle ourselves with all this superstition and mythology and belief in curses and we chain ourselves to these weird beliefs now tell me what have muslims done muslims have come not all but many muslims they've just replaced the shackles of non-islamic superstitions with our own we've only just replaced those evil gods with oh evil spirits jinn black magic evil eye curses bad luck sufferings muslims live in a world of superstition if we're to be honest europe europe is much freer intellectually and thereby potentially closer to Tawheed than many, many Muslims. Because they don't believe like that mentally. Mentally, they don't believe, generally speaking, in bad luck, omens, evil spirits. Some of them do, but generally they don't. If something goes wrong, they can just, they'll just say, oh, you know, I messed up in this. My relationship messed up, I messed up. They won't be like, oh, the evil spirits are upon me. Oh, I'm suffering bad luck because I committed a sin. Oh, the jinns have affected me. Oh, so-and-so has given me the evil eye. <laughs> Nonsense. All this superstition. Superstition. These are the new false gods that Muslims kind of replace the old gods with. They replace them with these new kind of neo superstitions. These neo kind of gods that we've got of, of bad luck. And, and people and religious people use this all the time to their advantage. Do you know what they will do? When a person is suffering, they will say to these, because the common people, their religion is like folklore. They will say to them, oh, do you know why you're having bad, do you know why you're suffering? Because you committed such and such a sin. We do not believe in karma. I don't believe in karma. You do sins and bad luck happens to you. What do you think this is? God damn it. What is this? Kind? We don't believe in this, we're not Hindus the last time I checked. <laughs> or are we? <laughs> Have we all of a sudden switched to Shri Ram and Shri Krishna? What is this? Karma, karma, karma. Twisting the words of God to prove these kind of weird superstitious beliefs and make people feel guilty. And they use this. So they get people, they kind of... They, they lure them into their sectarianism. Oh, you've been doing this because you've, you've committed all oh, these sins. You've gambled. You've taken drugs. You've done, and these things are wrong. But you're not, your, your bad luck doesn't come from these things. There's no such thing as bad luck. So that's what I wanted you to understand, people. It's important. Es muy importante. Okay, so I want you to kind of... Right, I want you to kind of let that settle. Don't let these people trick... This is how they trick the common people. Into kind of like they guilt trip them. Oh, do you know, if, you're, if you said the true Aqidah, if you had the true Aqidah, 
then you wouldn't be suffering in your life. What nonsense. What BS. If you had the true Akita. Abe chal. <laughs> if you had the true Akita. What nonsense is that? Your life don't have problems? Hell yes it does. Hell yeah it does. I can guarantee your life has problems. Everybody has problems. Right? So you say to people, oh, you're depressed. You know why you're depressed? Because you committed this sin and that sin. Nonsense. Nonsense. <laughs> this is, right, blag. <laughs> that is not what Muslims believe. So I'm just correcting this kind of belief. You know, speaking about that, <laughs> I had, you know, I've seen since last week, because I've obviously done this refutation, I've seen like all this, I've seen a lot of support and to all of you supporting me, right back at you people, man. Nothing but love people, nothing but love. But there's been a lot of hate as well. Uh, not a lot, but there's been a certain amount of hate. And I've seen every time something's going on, people will share it with me. <laughs> so I'll get like a WhatsApp message saying, hey, check this out, check this out. <laughs> so I get all these updates about people hating on me. And it's hilarious. So you get all kinds of people, yeah. So I had I had this one person uh, say, well, look, and he frames a question indirectly, indirectly, saying that how his young children, almost the same age as my two daughters, almost, I think he says like four and seven or something, or three and six or something, uh, and how they saw my thing and said, well, look how absurd this is. This person said music is not haram and how does that make a person a better person? And, you know, this person, uh, you know, and they, the children kind of said that. And the person said, wow, look, even my children can understand this. Wah, <laughs> shabash. <laughs> okay, let's ask them another mas'ala then. So, God, I'm stuck on this one chain that I've got. Uh, <laughs> you know where Imam Bukhari often refers to, let's say he keeps a rawi mubham. Who do you think this particular rawi is when he's using the term uh, Ahmad? Is he referring to... Uh, oh? <laughs> oh, wait, I've got another issue. You know, I was reading a verse in the Quran and it goes... Huh? I know, let me ask, let me ask Layla my, or Zara, Zara, better still, my three-year-old. <laughs> well, this is why you're stuck, you see, because your religion is at the level of a seven-year-old child. <laughs> shabash, shabash. <laughs> and this is how people think that's like an awesome refutation, like, wow, like my child knows that. <laughs> like, I mean, look, that's amazing. I'm sure your child is an awesome child. But with all due respect, if you're trying to take theology and jurisprudence from a four-year-old, right, that doesn't say much about you and your religion. <laughs> Next time I'll do that. You know, when I'm doing my research, I'll sit Zara, my little devil next to me and, and let her just tell me. <laughs> and somebody said on, on one of these things, oh my God, this guy. They, so they had a picture of me with when I'm dressed as Santa with Zara standing here, my three-year-old. And they said, oh my God. And this guy said his own daughter is possessed. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. He said the daughter possessed. <laughs> Trust me, she is like possessed. She, bloody, even today she almost destroyed half the house. <laughs> it's like, she's a nightmare, that one is. I don't know what drugs I was on <laughs> when she was conceived. I don't know. <laughs> no idea, people. But, uh... <sighs> right, so... So these were some of the refutations you get. So I read this one refutation where this lady said, not a refutation, I mean a diss. <laughs> so 
So I get these comments sent to me, see. So this lady said, oh, I could tell he's, he's messed up. And these are like modern looking folk. They're not like religious kind of. You see, the religious people, you can understand like maybe they're feeling insecure with some of my positions. So these are like very kind of regular modern folk. And she said, oh, I could just look at his face. And by looking at his face, you could tell he could never speak the haq. <laughs> oh, God damn. Can, can the Crown Prosecution Service, CPS, please hire this woman? <laughs> and the judge just says, well, well, thank you. Can the defense, now that the defense has given all their evidence, uh, would the face judger please just tell us by looking at the face? And she'll be like, mm, no, mm, not with that. That face is definitely a guilty face. <laughs> looking at the face, for God's sake. <laughs> oh, my God. Seriously, it's it's comical, people. Comical. Those of you just tuning in, click like, click share, people. Get this out there. Get this out there. And then, then, check this out. There's been another Juma Khutbah. I got a video clip of a Juma Khutbah sent. <laughs> a whole Juma Khutbah. Once again, from Green Lane. Green Lane Sharif. 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 <laughs> a Khutbah, people. Not a whole Khutbah, but a segment of a Khutbah dedicated to me. So, Sheikh Molana Sahib. There's no harm in mentioning Molana Saab's name. Obviously, the Molana, to be fair, the video had my name on it, as in, do not take knowledge from Mufti Abu Layth. But uh, <laughs> he just referred to me as this Mufti on Facebook, dresses like this and makes a joke. So this was Molana, one of the Imams, Molana. I believe his name is Zaka'ullah uh, Salim Saab. Damat barakatuhum al aliyah. Right, so uh, so Molana Sahib takes a part of his Juma segment out to address me, and he says, "You know this jahil. How can a person be a mufti when he's a jahil? <laughs> what an argument! <laughs> I just love the reasoning. Like that, I, I love it. <laughs> How can a person be capable when he's incapable?" <laughs> I love it. That's <laughs> that's how you win arguments, people. So he said, how can this person, this jahil, this ignorant person, he's mocking, he's mocking the deen of Allah. Hi, hi, deen of Allah. Right, so he said, how, this person's mocking, mocking the deen. First of all, I just want to say, people, look, you guys, and I'm not dissing all Salafis or anything, but Salafis, let's just say here, Green Lane, seem to be very upset here. I mean, you're a multi, globally, a multi-billion dollar kind of sect with so many contingents, so many units, international petrol dollars, all of these things. You have even in the UK a multi-million pound organization, a group with all these people and followers. Yeah, I'm just one person <laughs> using Facebook free. <laughs> this is this is coming back to look how many of them there are gunning for me. Bahut Nain Safi, Bahut Nain Safi. <laughs> this is, see, like all these people just, just want me. This, this has to, this is where the words of Gabbar, Gabbar Singh fit so true. Bahut Nain Safi, Bahut Nain Safi. So, Molana Sahib. He kind of says, oh, this person, he, you know, he, 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 he mocks Islam, mocks uh, our, the people of Tawheed. 
the people of Tawheed, <laughs> Molana Sahib, Hambi Ahle Tawheed may say, we're also from those people of Tawheed. <laughs> You know, why, why, are you, why are you differentiating between, when it comes to Tawheed, between us and you? We're, <laughs> we're, all, we're all the people of Tawheed. He says he mocks the people of Tawheed. He mocks the Hadith. He mocks the, he mocks and he mocks and he's a jahil. How can such people be a mufti? They are jahils. And then he says... Then he says, I blame their parents. <laughs> so all those people following me, he says that those people online, because they're jahil as well, listening to me. So then he says, you know, really, I blame their parents. <laughs> I blame their parents too. <laughs> You know, if obviously, if they hadn't consumed that chicken vindaloo that day, and the spices weren't that hot, then, <laughs> then the birds and the bees, and then, you know, the rest of the story, how it, how it goes. Obviously, how would have these people, let's blame their parents, God damn it. Their parents. Bob the Ponjo. He says, I blame all their parents. Because... Why, how did their parents, no, th their parents never taught them Tawheed. Their parents never taught them, <laughs> their parents never taught them the correct Aqidah. That's it. The correct Aqidah is what has messed up these people today. So they're all on Facebook live watching Mufti Abu Layth. Uh, <laughs> I blame my parents too. <laughs> let's let's blame everybody's parents. Yeah, why was there no contraception around at that time? Let's blame parents. <laughs> I want everybody to sit down and have that one to what. This is time to have that chat with the parents now. Say, <laughs> uh, Dad, Mom, please sit down. We need to have that discussion. <laughs> Control, yar. <laughs> you need to control. There's no, no control. And now, obviously, <laughs> now there's me. And now, who else is there to blame? Obviously, you. So, he puts it down to the lack of aqidah in Muslims. But look, let's be honest. Let's be honest. Everybody's aqidah. Everybody's aqidah really is something that Muslims have put together over the ages. Let's be real. True Aqidah, as people say, the Prophet only taught simple, like believe in Allah and revelation and afterlife and Allah is in control of everything. That's it. He never taught the Aqidah the way these people teach Aqidah. Nobody, this, anybody who says this, is, is misattributing Aqidah the way people... And this is, look, we have some groups that bang on about Aqidah, 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 Aqidah. And Maulana Saab saying this, I would ext I'd like to extend, extend a gesture, Maulana Sahib. If you can prove to me, since you're addressing me and you've called me out, as a Jahil, as a Jahil, I'm a Jahil, <laughs> jahil, Jahil, yeah. Yeah, I'm a Jahil, right? So I would like to extend to you an offer. You come and prove to me that you, this Aqidah you're teaching only from the Quran and Sunnah. I can guarantee you 100% you cannot prove it through the Quran and Sunnah. Just Quran and Sunnah. Guarantee. You cannot prove it. And since I'm a jahil, how difficult can it be to disprove me? So, eh, Maulana Sahib, aye, huzur. Take up my uh, convenient kind of... Since you called me out for being a jahil, 
which I am. So come correct me. <laughs> Take up my offer. Come sit face to face. Ar par. Goof the good. Let us kind of chat. And you prove since Aqidah is the thing, I will challenge, challenge that you cannot prove your Aqidah through Kitabi wa Sunnah, through the Quran and Sunnah exclusively. Exclusively and explicitly. Allah! Allah! So, Mawlana Sahib, see, and, that's, and since I'm a Jahil, it can't be that difficult, can it? So what say, so what say you, Huzur? <laughs> what is it? Duro duro sanu tar sande ho, asi bulaye te ne yande ho, nati nati. So this is my kind, humble, humble offer, humble. And your senior, I, I, saran kope, you know, I respect you. And come and have proved to me, since you're saying that the reason all these people are misguided is their aqidah, I, I extend that. Prove it to me through Quran wa Sunnah. And I guarantee, guarantee that you will not be able to do it. But then what do I know? I'm but just a, a, a jahil, <laughs> ain't I? Or in the words of the poet, Na khanjar uthega na talwar inse Ye bazu mere azmaye huye Nothing, nothing. The person will not be able to lift. A, and I'm not saying that. I'm saying that in general. The poet says, that's uh, Laknawi Nadir, Laknawi Sahib says in his poem, that they will not be able to lift nor a dagger nor a sword. That these arms of mine are tried and tested. So, so let's now move on to some of these questions, people. Right, so other than that, by the way, this isn't... I don't... I, I'm not dissing Salafis in general, okay? <laughs> Is that hard to believe now? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I'm, I'm not... <laughs> Love you, yeah. <laughs> all, all the Salafi out there. But the thing is that, look, I'm just being genuine. I'm being genuine. Right. S the Salafi thing is a, as are other groups as well, they are Puritanist kind of movements. They are based on Puritanism. Uh, this is why it's difficult for normal people to adhere to this kind of stuff, because the vast majority of human beings are not Puritanists. Who wants to be a Puritan? <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> what, what <laughs> people want this. They want to be in this dunya and enjoy this dunya. And Allah says, قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةِ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِي Tell me, Allah says, who has made this haram? What I have taken out for my uh, servants. True, true. In a hadith, the Messenger of Allah says, Inna Allah yuhibbu an yira athra ni'matihi ala abdi. Allah wants to see the blessings He's endowed upon His slaves upon them. Wants to see. So show your blessings. But don't be arrogant. Arrogance is when you look down on people. Like when you say, Oh, look at that. Look at that person, that tramp. <laughs> Astaghfirullah. Things like this. This kind of attitude. This... Haram people, haram. So you want to hear something haram from me? Haram. Arrogance is haram. There you go. So I thought I'd answer this. Another thing, look, you know, people go on about Quran. Sorry, they don't go on about Quran, unfortunately. They go on about, they do say it, but they don't really go on about it. They go on about hadith, 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 hadith. And I was listening to... A great Salafi Sheikh on YouTube, <laughs> as you do sometimes. <laughs> you know, in between the Bollywood, when accidentally, like, Sheikh, uh, a, a, a Sheikh comes up, say, yeah, oh, <laughs> chalo, yeah, chalo. <laughs> chalo, wuzu karke betle. 
to just sit with respect now that uh, <laughs> uh, so no so I was listening to Sheikh uh, Doctor Sheikh Saleh Al uh, what's his name Maghamisi I believe his name is Maghamisi or I might be mispronouncing it but he's well known and he's asked a question on uh, to, and he's dealing with this question, and I've answered it before, and I don't want to go into it too much now, but about the second coming of Jesus. And he's dissing this, obviously saying that, look, we'd, we accept this, and people who deny this are wrong, and so on. And, uh, and, and he's a bit, respect, a bit respectful to the people he's dissing, to be fair to him, but he's a bit respectful. But he's dissing the concept and saying that, no, and you must believe in this. And, and then, you see, I want to highlight something, people. I want to highlight something. Those of you just tuning in, right, if you click like and share, right, all right, click like, share, get this out there. He says that, uh, he says, oh, they say, how will Jesus come and where is Jesus? What is he just in the sky or is he in the cosmos? Or, and then he says, look, let me prove it to you. And he says, let's look at a verse of the Qur'an where Allah is speaking about the people in the cave and they slept for 309 years. And he says, and look, and they didn't change and stuff like this. And they wake up and they say, well, how long were we out for? And one of them says, was it a day? Was it half a day? And he says that, look, Allah's says look and he says Allah says they were out for 309 years so how do we believe in that then let's pause him right there now pause Sheikh al-Islam Saleh al-Maghamisi sahib please do not do these kind of dirty ones okay this is wrong See, this is from a kind of, and I'm not saying about him as a person, but this in general is from the sickness of people's hearts. It's from the sickness of their hearts that when they find, somebody finds a weakness or a doubt in hadith, a particular hadith, they try to project that person's doubt onto the Qur'an to prove a point that the Qur'an doesn't even mention. That is wrong. Wrong that is. <laughs> it is. Look, does the Quran speak about the, the coming of Jesus? No, it doesn't. The verse you're referring to, does it have anything to do with Jesus? No, it doesn't. Has the person raised a doubt about the verse of the Quran? No, he hasn't. Why are you transform why are you transporting his doubt to the Quran? That is wrong. See, it is a sickness that you find somebody pointing out a doubt in hadith, in a particular hadith, and then you try to you tr you try to kind of like arm lock or kind of force them into this belief by tripping them into a different ruling to do with the Quran. So now they should doubt the Quran too. Why? Like, what, what kind of a sick game is that? <laughs> I mean, I'm into all kind of sick games. <laughs> but this one, <laughs> this one, too much. <laughs> you know, this, this is not how you play these games. This, this is like the sheikh saying, he's, it's like he's gone into that saw, jigsaw mode. Let's play a game. <laughs> you will have, you know, why are you trying to make people have doubt about the Quran? That's not how Islam works. Tackle his issue. Answer his question. Prove him wrong. Fine. Don't just try to trip him up on the Quran now. The person hasn't said anything about the Quran. That verse has got nothing to do with this. Now you just want him to doubt this verse in the Quran too? Bahut nain safi here. Bahut nain safi this is this ain't on. Let me let me add to that. Why isn't this on? 
Because if this sheikh was being just, he would have done complete disclosure. Complete disclosure. Complete disclosure would have shown that in the verse when it said, and they slept 309 years, is that Allah saying it or is Allah quoting somebody saying it? Ah, you didn't think I would catch this one out? In Nati Nati? Is, am I wrong? Am I wrong? Wait, wait. <laughs> Allah. Sheikh al Islam, Ibn Ashur, the Grand Mufti of the Malikiya, who has his tafsir in 30 volumes. Let's go. I Ahlum wa sahlan, Shaykh. Shaykh, Ahlum wa sahlan. Tafaddal. Look. Where are we? Aina nahnu. Donde estamos? Right now. Look. This verse of the Quran. Where Allah in Surah Al-Kahf. Where he is speaking about these people who go, and then Allah begins by addressing that people will speak about the people of the cave. Let me just, from the beginning, I'll mention some of the verses just so you get an idea. Allah speaks. That, and that these people decide to go off to a cave and then they mention to each other let's go to a cave and so on and, uh, and then Allah says that they went into this deep sleep and that the, the sun would the way the entrance to the cave was that the sun would kind of rise and set in such a way that it didn't disturb them. And this is all part of the verses and then Allah addresses about them. And then, عَثَرْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَعْلَمُوا Then Allah says, we made it known about them. However, the verses that then go on, now listen to this. Check this out. Allah says, people will say about them, those of you who are just tuning in, click like, click share people, get this out there. People will say they were three, and the fourth was their dog. And people will say they were five, and the sixth was their dog. And this is nothing but guesses in the dark. Shots in the dark, people. رَجْمًا بِالْغَيْبِ وَيَقُولُونَ سَبْعَةٌ وَثَامِنُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ And some people said, oh, they must have been seven. Why? Because Allah added wow and this meant... No, but Allah never said there were seven. You say, this goes on with the verse. Or some people saying, there's seven. And the eighth was the dog. قُلْ رَبِّي أَعْلَمُ بِعِدَّتِهِمْ My Lord knows what their true number was. Now check this out. Check this out, people. Then Allah says regarding them, فَلَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرًا Do not debate about them except superficially. Do not debate about them except a superficial debate. This is what Allah is saying. And the verse goes on. And then the verse that this person is, is addressing, let me get to it people. Allah says, وَلَبِثُوا فِي كَهْفِهِمْ ثَلَاثَ مِئَةٍ سِنِينَ وَازْدَادُوا تِسْعَةٍ And they remained in their cave for 300 years and above that nine, 309 years. But let's look at what the Sahaba said about this. Let's read. What does Ibn Ashur say? First of all, he brings, he says that, for your Jews, and it is permissible. 
And he says, by the way, رُجُوعٌ إِلَى بَقِيَّةِ الْقِصَّةِ We're going back to the remaining story. فَيَجُوزُ أَن تَكُونَ جُمْلَةَ وَلَّبِثُ عَطْفًا عَلَى مَقُولِهِمْ فِي قَوْلِي سَيَقُولُونَ ثَلَاثَةُ الرَّابِعُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ He said that this is highly plausible. This is connected to the verse before it. That went before when they said, Allah said, they say they were three and the fourth was the dog. They say they were five and the sixth was the dog. This is connected to that. And he says, and they are saying, وَيَقُولُونَ لَبِثُوا لَبِثُوا فِي كَحْفِهِمْ ثَلَاثَ مِئَةِ سِنِينَ That they are saying that they remained in the cave for 309 years. And he says that, and this and this makes sense because the verse after it, Allah says that He says, "Qur Rabbi a'lamu bi'iddatihim," that my Lord is more knowledgeable about their number, and also Allah says that "Hu a'lamu bima labithu." Allah is more knowledgeable about what they, and that comes after that He's more knowledgeable about how long they stayed there, and then Ibn Ashur says. He says, and this is how Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an would read in his compilation of the Qur'an. He had the verse written as, وَقَالُوا They said, لَبِثُوا فِي كَحْفِهِمْ ثَلَاثَ مِئَةٍ سِنِينَ وَزْدَادُوا تِسْعَى They said, the people said they were in the cave for 309 years. And these were Christians here. Now, uh, or they were from the Christian heritage, and uh, yeah, I believe they were Christians. Now, but the point is that this, and then Ibn Ashur does mention, and it is plausible, you could take the other understanding in saying, Allah is saying this. It is plausible. And he says, according to which way you take it, the understanding in the verse gives a different meaning. Now, people, tell me, tell me, who read it like that as well from the Sahaba, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an? Why did they not mention this ikhtilaf? Why did they not say that, oh, uh, were they in the cave for 309 years? Some people said they were, some people said this is what some of the Christians used to believe about them. Why not give full disclosure? Are not the Muslims entitled to that? Do you have a right to superimpose your ta'wil? People may struggle with that. They may struggle. I'm not saying they will, but they may. Who are you to play God and to force people to believe in things if they struggle with it? The Sahaba clearly didn't all believe like you. You have a responsibility to give the diversity. And check this out. You were deadlocking the person into this, the belief about his problem with the hadith using this verse. And this verse didn't even necessarily mean what you were trying to say. So you were twisting. Look at this. And this is what I have a problem with. This is why we need to return to the voice of reason. Because we have a problem with this. Teach the deen as it was transmitted you do not have a right to standardize it according to your thing give it with all the diversity they say oh but if we give it with the diversity oh people don't know what to choose well i'm sorry if the people don't know what to choose that's not your problem what is your problem is you force feeding them one interpretation right so the point is that this verse of the Qur'an carries both. Even if somebody is to say, Oh, but can you prove from Ibn Mas'ud? Look, listen, it's not about proving it from Ibn Mas'ud. It's not about proving. All the Mufassireen show that this verse were, uh, is a at and very likely carries on from the guesses. Because were means and. So this is how the verse reads. Now, it's I accept. You can take that interpretation. You can take that interpretation to say, no, I believe here Allah is teaching us. He's not just saying that they said. 
But you have to accept that it's equally plausible that this and is carrying on from that verse, which it follows. This is what all the Mufassirin have said. So, this is my point when you deadlock people into trying to accept your beliefs. Because look, you have no right. You may cause the collapse of some people's faith. You have no right to do that. So everybody is at a different level. Everybody understands things differently. So let's take, I'll tell you what, let's take some rapid round people, some rapid round. Make America great again. <laughs> I'm sure Trump's doing a good job of that. <laughs> right, so people, what have we got here? What have we got? Right, so... Right now, good Nadara, what is your opinion on Aqidat al Tahawiyah? Look, I've highlighted before all creed today is dogma. Right? The Sahaba, the Prophet never ever taught creed like, never taught dogma like that. I'm not saying, I'm not openly criticizing, I'm not condemning, put it like this, I'm not condemning creed. Altogether, but I'm recognizing creed is part of an institutionalization process. Creed began hundreds of years after the Prophet. So, in the Prophet's time, in the Companion's time, in their students' time, in their students' time, up until the Atba'u Tabi'in in the time of the Salaf, believe it or not, one thing they didn't used to teach was Aqidah, like creed. They never used to say, We believe in this, 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 and had a long list. They did have beliefs. But what they believed, they never taught like that. They taught us the Mudawwana of Imam Malik is transmitted with over 30,000 Masail on Fiqh. Where are his things on, on Aqidah? You, you can try to extrapolate, but why didn't he teach it? Because people never used to teach creed like that. Creed, faith in Allah should just be simple. As the Prophet taught it. What came afterwards is all part of an institutionalization process. I recognize there's no, I don't think there's too much harm in accepting it, in let, allowing people to teach it and stuff like this. It's, it's there, it's got sincere reasons behind it as well. But unquestionably, one of the reasons behind it as well is to control people. Because by listing, let's say, 100 and so many, 160 beliefs, now when you don't believe in one of these, I chuck you out. And you no longer are a Muslim or you no longer are a... This kind of stuff is nonsense and it's nothing but institutionalization of the religion. Right. So that's the issue with creed. Allah. Right. Explain evil eye. I've explained that so many times, people. Evil eye does not exist. It is simply a synonym for envy. Uh, nobody gives you the evil eye. Grow up. <laughs> uh, grow up, people. Grow up. Leave superstitions. Leave karma. Leave evil spirits. Leave voodoo, magic, exorcisms, demons, fantasy religion. See, the problem is people struggle with reality. That's the problem. You see... The problem is people struggle with reality. Reality is too scary for them. Religion needs to be fantasy. It needs to be like superheroes and all these kind of fantasy sci-fi stuff going on for them to accept it as religion. If it was just, all right, Bash is in the house, people. All right. right. If it was just real, like, oh, everybody was just normal and real, just like you. There was no fantasy things going on. All of a sudden it becomes too scary. And this is why the people in the time of the Prophet struggled with the message. Because it was too real for them. They wanted this fantasy religion. They said, oh, why don't you show us this and make all these miraculous things and bring things down from the sky and have a garden over here and let's have fruit out of season and let's do this and oh let's have warriors fighting things and super kind of demigod kind of warriors and do the, the prophet was telling them look i'm just a normal person i'm a human being 
You see, reality is too scary for people. They can't embrace it. Uh, what is the punishment of missing a prayer? Well, making it up. <laughs> Listen, people, we need to stop obsessing with all these punishments, punishments, punishments. Okay. Sure, if you look through the Quran and Sunnah, you can find that angle if you want to focus on that angle. Like if you want to go kind of mining out these kind of quotations to build a perspective like that, you can do it. But I don't believe that that is the true, the kind of message the, the heart of the message of Islam. The message of Islam is, look, why don't you want to pray? It doesn't take long. At the very least, pray the fara'id, pray the obligatory prayers. Even if you're late, just pray it. It's the obligatory prayer. It's, it's your connection with your creator. What's the big deal? It doesn't take too much time. If you've missed it, make it up. You know, if you if you had such a busy day and you didn't pray or you're somebody who doesn't pray much and it's before you're going to sleep, just pray. Pray the obligatory prayers of all of the fara'id and just go to sleep. Now you might think, you know, you might think, well, oh my God, oh my God. But really, is this not how the Prophet dealt with people? I tell you, let me share a hadith with you people. A sahabi, a companion, came to the Prophet. Safwan ibn Mistah. I believe it was Saf Safwan ibn Mistah. But a companion came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And he's, his wife actually came to complain about him. <laughs> I've shared this before previously. And as it goes, so obviously they were newly married. And I think it probably been a little while and she went and she complained and said, oh, the, you know, to the prophet, he doesn't do this and he stops me from doing this and he stops me from doing that. And, and oh, and he doesn't even wake up to pray his Salat al-Subah. He doesn't even pray his Fajr. <laughs> Don't you love those kind of criticisms, by the way, the religious ones? <laughs> They're like the, you know, people go, hmm, he doesn't even pray. <laughs> and like so so now the prophet calls this companion and he says to him look uh don't stop her from doing this and don't stop her from doing that and that's fine i think she mentions two or three things and uh, two things in the and the third thing he says and what's this i'm hearing that you don't pray you don't pray subah so listen to i want you to listen to the response the person gives he says that Ya Rasulullah, Ya Messenger of Allah, he says, Inna qawmun la nastayqidhu illa ba'da tulu'i shams. He says, we are a people like our kind of tribe, our sub-tribe, that, that tribe he was from, from the outskirts of Medina. He said, we are a people, we don't wake up till after sun sunrise. Most Arabs used to wake up at dawn. This and it still is a culture. This is a culture in huge parts of uh, the Muslim world, and not even just the Muslim world. Huge parts of the world where, uh, especially with in warmer climates, so people wake up with this agriculture. They wake up around dawn. They get ready, and then and then they go out and they work in the fields and they farm. And then it gets too hot, so they have to go and rest. So this is a culture, regardless of religion. Now. He, he said, but his people, mi gente, <laughs> my people, he was like, my people, his people do not wake up until after sunrise. He said, that's the, the, that's the kind of habit. Now tell me, couldn't the Prophet have said that, well, fix your habit, God damn it. Couldn't the Prophet have said that? Couldn't the Prophet have said, yeah, well, you know, that's not going to be very comfortable when you're thrown in the fire of hell. <laughs> That wouldn't, could, couldn't, the Prophet could have said to him, yeah, but that's haram, that's kufr, that's, no. What did the Prophet say? The Prophet said, he said, he said, فصلي. He said, okay, when you wake up, pray. 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Messenger of God, rahmatan lil alameen, a mercy, a paragon of mercy for the world's people. Today, scholars are too scared to give that kind of fatwa. Most scholars will interpret this hadith and bend over backwards to interpret these hadith. And they will say, oh, the person had a medical condition and the person had, uh, he was hit in a battle and that's why he used to have heavy sleep. And, but the hadith, he says, all oh, my people. I say, well, fine, you don't need to give the fatwa because the messenger of Allah himself gave the ruling. Allah, Allah, people. So this is how I say, look, this is for the normal people. Normal people, most people don't pray. So I would say to them, look, if you pray, like even if you're only going to pray the obligatory prayers, the, the fard, two fard, then four, even if you're going to pray, even if you're going to pray them together, just pray them together. I mean, I'm not saying that's the advisable, but just do it. It's better than not doing it. It's awesome. Look, I advise people not to focus on <coughs> the kind of punishment, punishment, negative, everything, hellfire, all this kind of approach. When I read Islam, I, I recognize those rulings do exist. Those kind of discussions do exist. But I see that that's not how the Prophet used to do things. That it was about encouragement. It was about positivity. It was about optimism. Right, so, punishment makes us fear Allah. Yes, it does, but I don't, you see, to me, Allah is constantly reminding us of His mercy, Bismillah rahman rahim So that's how I know God. Let's take a few rapid round questions, people, then we'll wrap this up. What do you say? Let's take some rapid round. Why does Allah use the word haram only? for not eating pig but he doesn't use it for alcohol yeah i mean true allah does you don't have to use the word haram per se like you could say don't do this and you could say that that allah says you know don't even go close to it don't these are different ways of making something haram allah does say you know these things are from rich these things are, uh, they've got that kind of, uh, you know, people would translate these things as impure, but they've got that kind of uh, wrongfulness about them, that they are from the, the work of the devil, as in they lead you to fighting, they lead you to doing all these kind of things. So these verses do exist. You don't have to, to say something is forbidden, you don't have to use the word haram. You can say that, there's other ways, so for example, Allah could say, uh, could show like a punishment, as in say that people who do this, this will happen. That's one way of saying something is haram. Another way is that Allah could say, don't do this. Another way is Allah could say, don't even go close to this action. So there's different ways. It doesn't have to be that. Uh, where is the this hadith narrated? Which hadith are we talking about? Oh, the hadith of Safwan ibn Amistah. It's in several places. I know Bayhaqi. I know that Abu Dawood has it. I know it's in several uh, different uh, narrations. It's definitely in those in Abu Dawood. It's in uh, Bayhaqi brings it up. At Tahawi brings it up in his discussion. Uh, several people have brought up the hadith. And it does have some chains which are valid. And some chains are criticized, I accept that. Uh, practice of khatams and passing on good deeds. Uh, you see, these things are not general. See, this comes back to that kind of folklore r r layer of religion that I spoke about earlier on today. You know, the khatams and doing things and the dead, the spirits coming and visiting and all this kind of stuff. This is that kind of folklore level, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't really have any authenticity uh, within Islam like that. What about the print on your T-shirt? Hell yeah, people. Why is a skull? Is a skull haram? Do we not all carry a skull within us? <laughs> so, could a man lead jama'ah with his spouse? Of course he can. You mean as opposed to leading somebody else's spouse? <laughs> As, a, as opposed to being in somebody else's house, leading the other guy's wife in Salah. <laughs> right, you have to excuse my humor. But uh, 
Right, is making dua in congregation allowed? It's allowed, but it's not from the sunnah. But yeah, people do it, these kind of things. It isn't like, these kind of things are not forbidden, but they're not from the way the Prophet didn't teach them, but people kind of made, came up with them. And Is there a minimum number of people to make Jum'ah? There's a difference of opinion on this Zubair Shirazi. So people, uh, the Shafi'iyah, I believe, uh, took the ruling of 12 people. Some people said maybe 40. Some people said 12 because there's a hadith that when the people left the Prophet uh, during the khutbah of Jum'ah, 12 remained. Uh, the Hanafiya amongst them disagreed. And I believe uh, they said uh, you've got that. I believe the understanding is that Abu Yusuf, and I could be mixing this up, but I believe Abu Yusuf said that three, including the Imam, and Imam Abu Hanifa said, no, he just needs two, one Imam and one other person. Or worst case, I'm mixing up Abu Yusuf and Abu Hanifa, but that's within the Hanafi Madhab. I would actually personally agree with Imam Abu Hanifa and, and the Hanafi understanding here that Juma is permitted regardless of the number. Uh, because if the number was necessary, surely the Prophet would have explained it. And can we eat McDonald's? I mean, it depends what you're eating from McDonald's. So if you're eating fries, yes, you can eat fries and things like that. What do you say to those who accuse you of denying the unseen, who de accuse you of denying the unseen, a pillar of Iman? What unseen? How am I denying the unseen? Unseen is... Allah is the unseen. Revelation is the unseen. We've not seen the messenger of God. Uh, I don't deny these things. A life uh, that there will be a, a life after. I don't deny these things. When you're saying, are there other creations like the jinn? I don't deny that there's other creations, the jinn. What do they look like? Yeah, I don't buy into all this demon kind of, they look like horns and stuff like this. They, they're in a totally different realm. We don't know what they, what or how they like. Now, if you mean by the unseen things like magic, that's because magic is nonsense. <laughs> if you mean by that, if you mean by the unseen nonsense, <laughs> then what am I supposed to do if not deny it? Is pork gelatine halal? Uh, gelatine, I've answered in much detail before. There is a difference of opinion on several ulama with several ulama people like uh, Abu Yusuf from the Hanafiya, uh, Ibn Abdul Hakam from the Malikiya, and other people as well who have said, "Look, transformation in these things renders it halal." So even in the Hanafi madhab, you will find these fatawa that if bones or these other things, um, if they're crushed or they they transformed, they have a chemical transformation, which in Arabic you call istihala. It transforms a substantial, overwhelming part characteristic of it. It becomes halal. Based on that, all gelatine would be permissible. So, uh, personally, I don't necessarily opt for gelatine. But <laughs> I don't say like, can I have the most haramist thing you've got here? <laughs> but if something had gelatine to me, it wouldn't really be much of a problem. <laughs> it's not like haram has stopped me. <laughs> Don't misquote that, people. Don't misquote that. <laughs> what does uh, the poet say? He says, uh, you know, speaking about, <laughs> speaking about somebody he's in love with, that he's almost worshipping. You know, the old poets, they used to express it as though they worship the person. <laughs> they used to call them but as well, like idols. <laughs> the women, like goddesses. That's what they were. So he says, uh, he says, uh, he says, Kufar me bhi hum rehe iman ki taraf. That even in our disbelief, by chance, we happen to stay upon faith. <laughs> that Kaaba bhi nikla, kue jana ki taraf. That even, <laughs> even the direction that we were just facing the direction of her house. Like we used to always be obsessed with that direction. It turned out that that happened to be the Qibla as well. <laughs> So <laughs> that uh, what a poem, man! What a poem! And he gives a <laughs> he says in in another there's another one like that where he says Aziz Mia actually says it in his Kawali where he says he says that I prostrated that Mene Kaba Samajkar Jukai Jabi that 
I thought it was the Kaaba, like I thought this was the Qibla, so I prostrated. Tera sange dar ho to me kya It turned out to be your doorstep that I was prostrating at. What am I supposed to do about that? <laughs> I, to I tell you, I totally love the audacity and the confidence of the early Urdu poets. Gender interaction. Absolutely, people. Shared space between the gender is permissible as it was in the time of the Prophet. In the time of the Prophet, every place from the Masjid, from the Prophet's Mosque, to the Haram in Mecca, to the marketplaces, all had shared space between the genders. And so gender interaction was always taking place. And these kind of things are absolute. You see, people... And people say, oh my God, oh my God, if you're going to have gender interaction, everybody's going to be committing zina. Everybody's going to be, oh, they're going to be committing, uh, you know, oh, if people go out, then she's going to be. Some, like that guy said when he was trying to refute me, oh, he says that men and women can, if they want to meet each other or if they were interested in marriage, they can go on these dates in public places. He goes, oh, so if your sister goes out, what is she going to do now? She's going to fornicate. She's going to phone you. <laughs> I mean, seriously, why do they? I don't know what world these people live in because either. <laughs> I'm telling you, most men must be thinking, if only. <laughs> if only every woman you spoke to was just like, yeah, I'm totally. Now that you've spoken to me, I'm totally up for this. Like anything you want. <laughs> That would be like a man's dream. <laughs> I'm serious. Does that happen in his world? Like, can we come and live in his world? <laughs> Every woman, now that you've just had a conversation, it's like, yeah. So now that we've had this conversation, do I come to, to, to your place? Or <laughs> where are we going from here? Because obviously the next natural progression will be fornication. That's like obvious. <laughs> you know they one they, I don't I, I, it just I'm like gobs I think bloody hell I must be a recluse <laughs> it must just be the people around me are weirdos but around these people everybody's like just chilling <laughs> and then the second thing is why do they look so down upon like their sisters they go like oh if our sisters were to go out, they're just going to fornicate. Like, I mean, why do you have such a, like a, like such a derogatory view of your own sisters like that? That's just, that's, for God's sake, behave. Like, what, what the, like, like what, what do you think? Like, oh, that they just, like, you look at them as though they're absolute free prostitutes. <laughs> like, and, 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 I mean, first of all, the world isn't like that anyway, and all men probably wish it was, but it isn't. Secondly, right, that's such a derogatory and suspicious way to view your own kind of women folk. But anyway, anyway, people are people. What is the fatwa on cheese? Cheese, it's all good, man. Don't worry about cheese. Cheese is permissible. Any last few burning questions, people? We're going to wrap this up. Are you high? <laughs> as high as a kite. As high as a kite. Leslie. Right, so what, Mufti, are you on team Iva? All right, I tell you. Whoa. Whoa. Can't wait for the next episode, people. Shout out. Shout out going out, people. Shout out. Brothers Curtain. Shout out, all right, there you go. Going back, how would you answer the hadith when the Prophet told her to wash away her haid blood? How would you answer the hadith about when the Prophet told somebody to wash away menstrual blood? Yeah, because people don't want to see menstrual blood. People don't want to see snot. <laughs> you know, if, you, if your snot landed on your shirt, people don't want to see... <laughs> if, you're like, if you're like this, like... <laughs> like... Yeah, now that I've got all this snot, let me just hang it on my shoulder and just walk around with snot. <laughs> Why is it impure? <laughs> People don't want to see <laughs> menstrual blood or sperm. 
or if you're going to say about washing away the sperm in the other hadith, or even things like this mucus coming out of your nose, nobody wants to see it. So there you go. Right. Adam Aslam. All right. Doing it. Doing it. Aziz Mianite. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Right, people. I think I can't see any more questions. I think we should wrap it up. But the washing could have been because of Najasa. Yeah, it could have been, but it could have also been because nobody. Uh, absence from Friday, Juma Haram. Absence from Juma in this part of the world, if you're working and things like that. If people are working, I don't believe it's necessarily Haram. I believe they are excused. They don't need. Uh, because Juma, there's a discussion that what is the purpose of Juma? Is it more a kind of public statement that Muslims are making as a collective? Or is it more the ritual? Uh, or is it? A, it's definitely a combination of both. But which one preponderates? Allah preponderates people. Preponderates. So those who felt that it's more a public statement would, based on that understanding, you would say, well, since this isn't a Muslim country anyway, and it's not so. Juma, all, the public statement has a political factor in it as well. And that's why always the rulers' names are mentioned and the public get to know who the rulers are and stuff like this. So in non-Muslim countries, that kind of stuff, it really only has the ritual side. So based on this, if you were working, should you kind of say, oh, I'm going to quit my job for the sake of Allah? I mean, look, you can quit your job if you want. It's totally your call. It's your life. But do you have to quit your job because you're going to ha have to go pray Juma? In my understanding, no, that's not true. Juma can be left for many reasons. Imam Malik himself, the great don and legend of Medina, never prayed in the masjid for 25 years. 25 years he never went to the masjid. And when he was asked, he said, he said it's for issues. And some people said it was for his medical issues, but that's not what he said in his rewire. He said that because if he went, he said he just can't put up with some of the things that were going on. So he said that, I, so I'm just boycott. <laughs> but he was a legend. Imam Malik all the way. Right. So opinion on strict Quranists. Look, I, I totally disagree with abandoning the sunnah. The sunnah is what carries this deen. But I make a distinction between the sunnah and the hadith. Sunnah and the hadith. Imam Malik made that distinction. Imam Abu Hanifa made that distinction. Imam Shafi'i didn't. But okay, Imam Shafi'i aside. <laughs> but the dons, the heavyweights like Imam Malik and Abu Hanifa made that distinction. Sunnah ala ra'si wal ayn. But as to, as to, as to, as to hadith, they can be questioned. Not every hadith reflects the sunnah as Imam Malik taught. Right. So, yes. And the problem with this kind of dogmatism and hadith absolutism is then you present weird hadith. You're stuck with weird hadith like the one about Moses, alayhi uh, salam. And these are derogatory. And then Muslims struggle with that kind of belief. And you find like contradictory hadith and you find hadith that are like insulting and hadith which are blasphemous like the, the one in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet sent Ali radiallahu anh, to kill somebody and when he got there for adultery then he realized oh the guy didn't even have a penis so how could have he committed adultery and it was a mistake and then they let him off and and this kind of this kind of nonsense so look let's be this is why I love the way that Imam Malik kind of highlighted for us Imam Malik brought Sahih Hadith and he said, وَقَدْ لَقَدْ وَرَدَ الْخَبَرِ The Khabar has come and we do not accept it because we have no idea what it's on about. لا ندري ما حقيقته. This is the wording of Imam Malik. And he paved this path for us and many people before him. So that's what we take. I hope that makes sense, people. Is covering the hair compulsory for women? The general understanding people would go with is yes. Uh, there's been some difference of opinion. Uh, especially more so in this day and age, I think people like Sheikh Khalid Abu Fadl from America, I believe he's in America or Canada, I could be wrong, but he's, he has his Usuli Institute. He's given the understanding that uh, and other people and some other people that covering the hair is not an obligation. The main thing is modesty in Islam. That's his view that several people, I think it's an interesting debate. I 
I do think that the main emphasis in Islam has always been modesty. Uh, Ibn Ashur in his tafsir doesn't go into who disagreed, but he shows there was some disagreement about the here. And, um, and then there is a fatwa about Imam Malik, about a woman with her servants and her slave men. And he says, Imam Malik says that the woman doesn't need to cover her hair in front of those those kind of men that she that were her slave men. Whereas normally people would say she has to. So Imam Malik obviously made some distinction. Now, then there is a distinction between the general aura and the lesser aura uh, within Salah. But most people don't carry that across outside of Salah. I would say, look. In the West, where people are struggling, where people don't, you know, we don't have this kind of, uh, this, this general kind of culture, the main thing is modesty, right? As long as you're doing that, that's what I would say. And let people, everybody's living their individual struggle. And look, there is a diversity within Islam. And these things like hijab, and hijab today seems to be this, this is a new, this is a new fallacy. That hijab in the last 100 years seems to mean this head covering. Never meant that in the past. Ever, ever, ever. They used to, they call that the khimar, and there were never books written on the khimar. Ever. Right, so now you've got tons of books on the hijab, which means this. This is not something in the past that used to happen. This is a recent modern phenomenon. And it's a reaction to the modern world. So uh, certain people in the Muslim world are trying to reinforce what they're calling an Islamic identity to contrast what would be the, the Western identity. And I just feel in, in, in this kind of warfare, this cultural warfare, there's some casualties of war. And people need to go easy with that kind of stuff. That's my understanding anyway. I think... Uh, and. You know, the main thing is modesty. That's that's the main thing. I hope that's been of some help, people. Are you allowed to roll up your trousers in Salah? You can do whatever you want. <laughs> Just don't roll them up too high. <laughs> but this rolling up for Salah is nonsensical. There's no such ruling that for Salah you need to roll up. In fact, I would deem that a bid'ah, an innovation, if people just roll up for Salah, or it would be at least discouraged. Right, people, I think that's going to wrap it up. Can the Jummah Khutbah be delivered? Uh, it can be delivered in both, in Arabic, and you can do a little portion of Arabic and the rest in English. Yep, so in the Quran, it says, Yudnina alayhinna min jalabi bihinna. Yep, and the people said, I've discussed this before, that no way in the, you see, this is the thing, no way in the Quran does it clearly address uh, the covering of the hair. This is why it became a debate. Uh, now this is an implicit ruling because khimar is something used to cover the head. So Allah is saying that they should cover their kind of, uh, because their, their top, the upper chest, uh, women was usually bare. So they, the kind of cut that they would have would be low cut. So their head could comfortably fit through. And they never used to have buttons. So if they moved around, you could see all the kind of cleavage and everything. So this is why Allah says that the, the scarves they're wearing, let them cover their chests with it. The question here is, is the scarf then necessary? This is what became the debate. One thing you can definitely agree that within generations, the Muslims as a norm embraced the scarf as part of the hijab, uh, the whole covering. That is unquestionable. Muslim culture embraced it as a whole. So, but does the debate still remain as an academic debate? That's why I mentioned people like Sheikh Khalid Abul Fadl and other people. I know, uh, 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 what is it, Allama uh, Javed Ghamidi and other people as well. I think there was an article mentioning about five, six scholars around the world who have, who have mentioned this view. And I think some of the Al-Azhari ulama have mentioned it as well and other people. Cool people, I hope that's of some help. Uh, all right, where did I get that? I should actually sell this. What do you think? Uh, I should make my own brand. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about, people. That's what I'm talking about. And I won't tell you what it says on it. <laughs> nutty, nutty. Right, people, going to wrap this up. Those of you on Facebook, right, I only have two pages. They're both with the same name, Mufti Abu Layth. That's it. It's not like a hidden page, right? <laughs> and I'm sharing my public one with my, uh, my, with my private. It's not private, but it's called my regular one. And the public page, one's a page and one's the regular Facebook kind of profile. So like them both, add them, share them. 
Uh, like this video, share it, get it out there, people. If you've got any questions, message me. I will try to get back to you. If you're on Snapchat, add me, Malm2014, M-A-L-M, 2014. If you're on Instagram, add me. I will try to do more and more Instagram. I've just found out about some awesome things. Please, can you give the UCL, UCL Islamic Isaac a ride, people. That's it, man. Keep it real. Keep it awesome, people. Take very good care of yourselves till next week, inshallah. Those of you with the love, by the way, I dearly appreciate all your support, especially when I get this hate. Totally love your support. So right back at all of you. Stay blessed, inshallah. May Allah forever keep you all smiling. Take very good care of yourselves. Till next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.